Okay, so this is a joint uh, um, talk and um, basically just to jump right into it, cell phone access. For most of the people in this room, uh, we all know there's great textbooks and papers on uh, how to do um, uh, avian preparations of different types, but for the upcoming generation, if it isn't on your cell phone, maybe it doesn't exist. So, um, our, sorry, which button is it? That one? Okay. So um, the, what we're going to do is highlight two different um, uh, websites here um, and uh, tools that are online. So um, if, you go, if you Google birds UBC, there's a good chance that you'll come up with uh, my avian preparation website that has different components. And this is something, the idea is for the graduate students and the upcoming generation so that they can, even if they weren't planning to make a specimen, they're in the field, they lost stuff, they can still do it. So um, the video section is various videos, YouTubes, then there's uh, websites that I think are, are of use and various um, papers that are PDFs and um, websites designed for multi-use uh, in terms of, um, there's a poster up there presented at the uh, forensic conference basically making reference collections and also collecting internal morphology which is more or less what I'm going to talk about today. So the actual titles in the presentation, I'm not going to read out the list. Remember, it's on a public museum website. The first two are sort of gentle to get you into it. The bones on how to actually make a specimen are 2 to 5B. And 2 and 4 take you right through it in a straight line. And then the odd numbers give you all the va variations. Then you get 6 to 10B. And that's basically collecting internal morph morphology. Uh, 11 just gives you a variety of the different kind of specimens that have been produced over the ages. The ones that are pale are in prep. And the last one, data, labeling, and how critically important it is that um, that's done properly. So um, just a quick taste on how the um, skinning goes. There's detailed instructions and also places where people frequently ask questions. People often get balled up with the difference between where the eyeball is and the ear. So um, just so that that's pointed out, here's one of the variations, which is um, the behind the head cut for birds that have um, basically tiny necks and huge heads. And um, also the surprises. You might forget that you're looking at a woodpecker and you might think you've got some interesting nematodes or something. So, you know, people often get surprised. Yes, we definitely have to sew the bird and, um, and we have to deal with the beaks. And with the beaks, I can't remember how many methods. There's at least three different methods. You're in the field, you've forgotten everything, you have to do your label and you don't know what to do. This is not up on the LSU website yet. It's been revised, as you can see. It's 12 pages on how to write a label. It covers almost everything. Uh, you can have differences of opinion. And a pet peeve of mine is how you write the date. You might actually want to know which 83 this uh, female ivory woodpecker when she was collected. And uh, there are different protocols. I didn't put that slide up because I knew I was out of time. Internal morphology. Um, you no, you've got this bird, and you don't know whether it's a female or it's a juvenile or what it is. So, um, and you know that you can that uh, you can look at pneumatization, but you can't remember it. So again, you go to your cell phone, and it illustrates all the different kinds, and it reminds you that the larger pigeons only get to 75% pneumatized, no matter how old they are. Um, the same deal with uh, crop contents and. Um, stomach contents and how to rank it, and the part that a lot of people need. I got a dead bird and I want to know whether it's a boy or a girl, and I know the gonads are in there somewhere. So um, illustrating that birds have six kidneys, where you actually look for the gonads. The gonads can look differently, and oh my god, I found something else in there. What is that thing? Okay, that cancer-like growth. Females, some people don't know that by looking at the uh, oviduct, you can tell whether or not an egg has been laid. That, would, that one would be classed in the virgin type in terms of no eggs have been laid versus a convoluted. And in the sexing PowerPoint, there are two quizzes. The first one builds up your confidence, and the second one's called clear as mud, and you can bet what that one does. 
So um, this one is a good um, discussion about condition. They're both barred out. And you can see that one of them is definitely a little fattier than others. A pet peeve of mine is we've got a lot of birds in the collection. It says fat level 2, fat level 4. I'm still looking for fat level 6. I don't know what the scale is. So in the fat PowerPoint, got to watch out. That's not quite the phrasing I meant. Anyway, there's three different scales. There's the Winker scale, there's the LSU scale, and then the scale that's used, developed by the Burke, which we use here as well. You can all giggle and read extreme fat if you like. Um, but um, the numeric system, as I say, is something I'm against because you don't know what you're doing. Okay, breathe. I forgot to do that. Okay, now how do you actually take the tissue sampling and what are the tricks? So all of it seems very routine. I love this that I learned at LSU, which is the business of don't try to get the tissues in the vial by having the vial on the table. That can be very entertaining. And sometimes you really want to use a different vial for some of the tissues. So what we have here is, you know, obviously the muscle tissue can't go in with the, um, with the uh, liver tissue. So you've got lead poisoning in the swan and uh, rodenticide in, in the barn owl. Um, reminder course. We all know there's ectoparasites. You've forgotten, you pull out your cell phone, and you can get a quick idea of the different types. Now this one, of course, assumes you've got a microscope with you, but it reminds you that they exist. The one I'm excited about, and it came about because I went to the Wildlife Forensic Conference. Two different people came up to me, and they said, you know, you don't have determining cause of death. So um, all the ones saying sample are from uh, Science and Advice of Scottish, uh, of S Scottish Agriculture. And um, basically, especially for the uh, carboforans, they kill people too. So if you see a bird with blue crystals, you really should not touch it. So um, again, it's going to run through uh, the different uh, avian diseases and also in terms of looking at a wound to determine whether it happened after the bird died or when it was alive. I don't see any bruising around this particular one. I think a coyote or a dog picked up this barn owl after it was dead. There was nothing on the skin either. Now in the kind of fun stuff, also in cause of death, there is a difference between a bird's wing that has gone through a natural gas flare versus one that has been electrocuted. And I think that PowerPoint is going to be a lot of fun to do. So that's my next project. Um, if you ever find one of these, You'll, and bring it to a curator in a museum, you'll have a friend for life, <laughs> okay? There are very few geandromorphs. And this particular one is the one at the, Phil uh, the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philly. And uh, it was prepared by Ridgway himself, roughly 1910. And um, it's just gorgeous. So, um, and the PowerPoint reminds you what you want to look for. You want to look for a testes and an ovary in this bird. And uh, if you're somewhere where you don't have a permit, please cut it open. Look at it. It's amazing. So um, that, now if you, oh, I forgot to say when the other slide was up. If you need to find amazing birds and geandromorphs, not that it's a Darwin core term, you <laughs> would need to listen to what John has to say. Uh, John has to say. Genetromorph is in the list of possible sex values in Darwin Core. However, Dar <laughs> controlled vocabularies are not well managed these days. We're more worried about getting data published than we are worried about the content of the data at this point. That is changing. So I was asked to say something about a p potential destination for information um, from sources like these to world at large. And so I'm going to talk just a little bit about Ornus. Those of you who attended the VertNet symposium or workshop earlier today, um, partial apologies. This isn't a complete overlap, but some of it will be familiar to you. Um, what I'm talking about today is an idea of going from the specimen to online databases, access via the web of um, of the actual collections data 
and to its full richness as much as possible. The history of this stems back to basically coming from collection databases through some kind of transformation process to a portal on the web. And I don't want to go into that too much. What I do want to go into is um, some of what the process was historically to come up with a network like Ornus where specimen and observation data are shared. This is a, a screenshot of the classic Ornus portal showing that you have access to multiple different collections all at the same time. There's lots of other stuff on the page that is about making your query, but the idea is to ask the same question of all of those collections at the same time in order to get back data relevant to your work. The way it was, uh, or as a parallel part of that process, was making the data that we had more relevant, and that had to do with georeferencing the records that we had. As you know, most specimens come with label information where the locality is a descriptive um, text on the label, and it's not in a form that can be used in any kind of spatial analysis, it can't be mapped. And so part of Ornus and other projects like it was to do collaborations among institutions to georeference those label data and so that the information could be mapped. The process involved lots of institutions working together, and for Ornus at least, this is a map of the results. In Ornus, we had seven institutions who were work centers working on behalf of all of the participants to georeference as much of their collections as we could. You'll see that there's a nice outline of Colorado and another nice outline of New York. It's stuff that we didn't get to. And the reason was that Ornus became too popular. When we began, we asked for enough money to georeference North America. But Ornus was constantly growing. We had more and more participants all the time. By the end, a few things got left out. If you know a lot about New York or Colorado and would like to do some georeferencing, it's wide open. <laughs> In addition, having put together methods and so on for doing the georeferencing, there has been a lot of impact as a result beyond the, the projects like Ornus. And here you can see something of that impact. We produced methods for georeferencing uh, documents, books even, and have uh, held 30 workshops worldwide since 2003 with, I guess, more than 600 trained now as of this summer. So quite a bit of impact. It's been interesting. This is a graph showing the growth of the vertebrate networks. Ornus itself is in yellow there. You can see that the content of Ornus is growing all the time. More and more institutions getting involved. That's great, but it's based on some technology that had some problems. And the problems are these. Problems of performance, in which this graph sort of shows what the whole story is. Never mind the good things, like yellow and green, which is our potential to grow the network. And look only at blue and red. Blue says it's functional. Red says it's not. This is not the worst case scenario. This is basically what it's like all the time. It's because you have to rely on being connected to a server and to every server, and that just doesn't happen all the time. So it's fragile. Perfor performance is a problem. Because of that connection, this is sort of a, a spaghetti diagram of what the network really looks like. There's lots and lots of connections out there, and some of them go down. Some of them end up being unviable because the information technology department and the university says, no more of that. We're not allowing you to do that, and then it finally drops off. So I call this a diffuse private cloud, and it becomes problematic for scalability. It becomes expensive. And the impact of all that problem is that over time, this little gray bar here has grown. The gray bar is a waiting list. And if you look carefully, that waiting list has actually grown faster than the networks themselves. We have a whole potential network out there of folks who would really like to play but can't. And that's continued even today. So we're trying to solve that right now by uh, changing the network architecture, creating something called VertNet that's not just birds, but all of the vertebrates together, and making data publishing a much easier and less expensive process. 
And then finally, what we'd really like to do, besides just publishing the raw data, is to make it relevant in other contexts. Every different way that we can look at these data allow us to investigate something interesting about that. So I'll give, give you just one example to give you an idea. Map of Life is a, an online um, application that allows you to view different aspects of knowledge about um, life. In this case, I'm looking at only two different data sources, but two different data sources that work well together. The dots are from sources like Ornus. In this case, they actually come from GBIF, which also contains all the Ornus information, mapped over the top of an expert range map from the IUCN for a species of uh, black-chested buzzard eagle in uh, South America. And you can see that there's fairly good coincidence between the known uh, locations of the species and the expert range. But it also shows you that there's a whole lot of missing information about the species, big gaps in what we know or in, in our sampling of the species. Now, this is actually a pretty well-behaved uh, confluence of information, but you can quite well imagine that this would be quite useful to look for outliers, to see if there's a record in a collection that falls outside the uh, expert range, and that would be interesting to look at, either as a potential problem, the data are wrong one way or another, taxonomically or geographically, or it could mean that we don't know as much as we thought we did. Both are interesting and from their different aspects. And I think I've done it.